We're in lesson number 17 in the book of 2 Samuel, lesson 17. And the title of this lesson comes off of the title of last week's lesson. The last lesson was entitled, The Two-Year Conspiracy to Terminate the Lord's Anointed. This week's lesson is titled, The Anointed One's Response to the Conspiracy. And if you remember last week, we uh, saw in the passages last week, 12 elements that come in order because it's the way humans and mankind were created by God and how we think. The 12 elements of how a conspiracy develops among people and among and, and how a conspirator will roll it out. And it'll always be in the same order. Every conspiracy always happens in the same order because it's the way we think. It's the way God made us to think. No matter who you are, no matter what culture you're in, where you are as a human, you think in this, this pattern when you start to build a conspiracy. Okay. Now, at the end of last week's lesson, I stated, if you discover that a, dis a conspiracy is developing... Tell the anointed one so he can respond while still in power. You know, the scripture tells us that those of us who know God's word, absolutely know God's word, all the story and the, story, the little stories in the big story of God's word, that we have insight better than anyone else out in the world because the Bible tells us the things we need to know to read the signs that are out there. He who has insight will know the signs of the time. So, when I said to you, if you discover a conspiracy is developing, tell the anointed one so he can respond while still in power. And I did not explain where I got that thought at the end of last week's lesson. Well, you ought to know me well enough to know that that thought is not mine. That point did not come from me. It came from the scripture. None of the Old Testament writers were in Hebron when Absalom went and was crowned the king. Second Samuel was compiled from the writings of Nathan and Gad. And because both were actually in Jerusalem with David, neither Nathan nor Gad could give an eyewitness account of what happened in Hebron. So we do not know and have are never told how Absalom was crowned in Hebron and what the hoopla was and what kind of celebration there was. Okay, this is one thing that I can say for sure though. Because Absalom had sent word throughout all of Israel that when they heard the trumpet blast, all the people should shout, Absalom is king in Hebron. I want to tell you this. David had to have heard the trumpet blast as the signal reverberated through the promised land. Now in my mind's eye, I can picture this happening. I can picture David is sitting there on his throne listening to a case when the trumpet is blown in Jerusalem. They say, wait a minute, it's blown in Hebron. No, 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 no. What, what I can see is that, that when the trumpet is blown in Hebron, then, it is, then another trumpet is blown a little further down the road, another little down the road, another little down the road, like I explained as it begins to scatter out through all the entire promised land. And I can see David pulling his head back, sitting forward in his chair, and then looking around the courtroom as he wonders, what has happened? What is that? And he had to know from the sound of the ram's horn, the blow, someone had been crowned. In what city has some crowning occurred? I can imagine hearing David even saying, someone, please find out what is happening in my kingdom. Oh, but it will not take long. It will not take long. Remember I said, if you find out about a conspiracy, go tell the anointed. Someone has learned of the conspiracy. Someone had the fortitude and the integrity to notify the target of the conspiracy, the anointed one. It was the messenger who showed up. The messenger arrived to tell David about his son's establishment in Hebron as the king of Hebron and the conspiracy. 
David became frightened by Absalom's threat. We hear of David's flight from Jerusalem in verse number 13, the next verse after we finished the last lesson. Then a messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. David said to all of his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for otherwise none of us will escape from Absalom. Go in haste, or he will overtake us quickly and bring down calamity on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Why the king was afraid of Absalom, we really do not know. We do know that David knew his son, and he knew what Absalom could do. No doubt, David had heard the faint trumpet sound from down south. And then he heard the trumpet come a little, the next trumpet down the road blow a little louder and closer to Jerusalem. And then he heard the trumpet on the south gate of Jerusalem. And then came the blast of the trumpet to the west of Jerusalem, to the north in Jerusalem, and to the east gates of Jerusalem. As that sound just begins to to reverberate out throughout the whole promised land. From there he heard the trumpet, uh, or the trumpets, as they sounded in in all directions, moving west and north and east and getting further and further and further away. And with the word from the only messenger, David only knew the possibility of what Absalom could do. He did not know exactly how strong Absalom's backing was. But David thought Absalom could have amassed a great army in the previous four years that could annihilate David and all his forces very easily there in Jerusalem. So David decided to leave his palace And leave his town. David was a great war tactician. And he knew that he needed to take action. He knew that Jerusalem was not the place to make his stand. He did not know how many conspirators lurked behind each house door in the city. And so David had to take precautions to protect those with him. The confidence to do this came with the word of all of his servants who spoke up to David after they heard the messenger tell David about Absalom. Verse number 15. Then the king's servants said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king chooses. So the king went out and all his household with him. But the king left ten concubines to keep the house. Out from the palace they went. And that included the bodyguards. We've already learned that the commander of the bodyguards was Benaniah. And now we also have learned in the past that the bodyguards were hired Philistines from the tribes of the Cherethites and the Pelethites. And then we also see here the word Gittites. That's another word for the name of the Philistine Gathites. Those who were from Gath, who were under the command of Benaniah, as well as all of the original defectors from Saul's kingdom who were still alive and joined David when he was hiding in the Philistine strip, the Gaza strip as we call it, before he became king. This group was not small. It included the families also, the wives and the children of all the men departing with David, of the, of the bodyguards and of the warriors, the 600 warriors that were with David. And when the whole band of David's team came to the very last house on the road out of town, they stopped and David took an inventory of who was there. I want you to notice that the compiler tells us that the 600 men who had come with him from Gath passed on before the king. Now, these were not Philistines, folks. These were not Gathites. If, j- just as a reminder about these men, in 1 Samuel, while David was running from Saul, 600 Israelite men joined David in the wilderness to support David. These men were not alone. 
as we found out when we studied through 1 Samuel, their families were with them, their wives and their children. So when David became a friend of the king of Gath now, David moved with his wives, no children yet, with his army, these men from the Israelites, and their families may move to Gath. Now, the king of Gath, there were so many of them that the king of Gath gave David a border town named Ziklag. It was actually in the Philistine area right on the border between uh, the Philistines and the tribal area of Judah. But because it was given to David, it became part of the tribal area of Judah. Achish was the king of Gath at the time that that happened. 1 Samuel 27, 5 through 7 tells us this about that transaction. Then David said, said to Achish, If now I have found favor in your sight, let them give me a place in one of the cities in the country that I may live there. For why should your servant live in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. The number of days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. So how long he had been over in the Philistines? A year and four months. And then a city was given to David, Ziklag, that became part of the tribal area. The Philistines gave it to David, the king of Gath, of one of the, one of the kings of the lords of the Philistines, the king of Gath, Achish, gave it to David and transferred the deed to that property to David, which ultimately meant it was transferred to the tribal area of Judah. These 600 men were loyal to David. They had been with him through thick and thin. David was going to protect them. But it also meant many mouths that needed to be fed every day while they were on the run. And undoubtedly, David has more than a thousand people with him as they're leaving Jerusalem. J just add it up. 600 warriors, all of his bodyguards, and some from the, uh, others from Gath plus all their wives and kids, a thousand may be a very conservative number. It may have been more than that. So they were with him, and he's counting the army, the family, his wives, his children, his bodyguards, their families, and all the army and their families, and an inventory was needed as everyone passed that last house on the city's edge. So David would know what to do. And so the king's inventory comes to us next. And so at the edge of town. We hear the king's inventory of those coming with him. On his flight out of town. And in the inventory. David takes the time to speak with a man. By the name of Ataiah the Gittite. He's a Philistine from the city of Gath. Verse number 19. He's the newcomer in the kingdom. Then the king said to Ataiah, the Gittite, Why will you also go with us? Return and remain with the king, for you are a foreigner and also an exile. Return to your own place. You came only yesterday, and shall I today make you wander with us while I go where I will? Return and take back your brothers. Mercy and truth be with you. So David says to Atiyah, return and take back your brothers with you. Atiyah was not alone in the city when they came in exile. He would have had his family there on the road with him, with David also. And Atiyah's brothers were also there on the road with their families. The numbers are just getting bigger here. And Atiyah was a newcomer to the kingdom, coming to the kingdom in exile from the Philistine area to get away for safety. Uh, why he defected from the Philistines, we do not know. But he and his extended family were in exile in Jerusalem and had only been there one day. But now we come to the new convert in the kingdom. But Atiyah answered the king and said, As the Lord lives, and as my Lord the king lives, surely wherever my Lord the king may be, whether for death or for life, there also your servant will be. Therefore David said to Atiyah, 
go and pass over. So Atiyah the Gittite passed over with all his men and all the little ones who were with him. That means all the family who was with him, with, with Atiyah, his brothers, their wives and all of that, they went over. Now I wish I knew when Atiyah met David. Was it years before when David was living in Gath? Well, we don't know. Uh, be that as it may, it is clear from Atiyah's words that he was a new convert to Israel, most likely a convert to its theology and also to its God, the Lord God. So Atiyah the Gittite passed over with all his men and all the little ones who were with him. So if his men were there, their families were there because that's the little ones were with them also. Well, the new calamity in the kingdom comes along. Verse number 23. While all the country was weeping with a loud voice, all the people passed over. The king also passed over the brook Kidron, and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. With his faithful followers and their families, the king was headed east across the Kidron Valley. Just across the Kidron Valley, if you remember, was the Mount of Olives. And the whole clan would soon be on the way to the wilderness past the Mount of Olives. They would pass through the same wilderness that one day Jesus would go through far into the future and stay for 40 days alone in prayer after his baptism. Well, amongst the group was the king's priest. David noticed that Zadok, the high priest, was with him. He was the king's priest, but he was also the high priest of Israel. Zadok had gathered the Levites, evidently, and their families, and they had also packed up the Ark of the Covenant and were taking it out of town with David as the flight from Jerusalem was occurring. Word had gotten out. So here we come to David's interaction with Zadok here in verse number 24. Where the ark belonged is really the topic in this passage. Now behold, Zadok also came and all the Levites with him carrying the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God and Abiathar came up until all the people had finished passing from the city. The king said to Zadok, return the ark of God to the city and if I find favor in the sight of the Lord then he will bring me back again and show me both it and his habitation but if he should say thus I have no delight in you behold here I am let him do to me as seems good to him so evidently David felt good enough about Absalom to be confident that Zadok the priest, the high priest, and the ark would be safe in Jerusalem when Absalom arrived there on his conspiracy to take the kingdom. Absalom would have wanted the blessing of the Lord, by the way, after all, on, on his kingdom by taking his father's place. Remember, the Lord had promised David that one of his sons would sit on the throne forever. And Absalom most likely thought that he was the one. Amnon was dead and out of the way. Chileab, also called Daniel, his other name is Daniel, was the son of Abigail, uh, David's wife. We know nothing about Chileab. Uh, or even if he was still alive at this time. However, some would think that the next king would be placed on the throne in birth order. So it would be, it would be uh, Amnon, but he's dead. Chileb, but he's dead. A Absalom, he's the next one. He's the third. But that was not the hard rule in Israel as we will find out. Even though it was a hard rule in all the other Gentile nations around Israel, it was not the hard rule in Israel. Israel is always different than all the other nations of the rest of the world. David was not the oldest son of Jesse, and yet he became king. Solomon was not the oldest son of David, and yet he became king. 
when looking at the rest of the kings of Israel, the rule does not apply. Absalom must have determined in his mind because of the general rule in the rest of all the Gentile nations around Israel that he was the only one worthy of the position and was ready to take it from his father. The ark remained, was taken back, remained there in Jerusalem and Zadok had, had word from David that he would wait to return to Jerusalem when Zadok said it is safe. Well, we knew where the ark belonged, and now we're going to find out where the priest belonged. The king said also to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace, and your two sons with you, your son Ahimaaz and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. See, I am going to wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. Therefore, Zadok and Abiathar returned the ark of God to Jerusalem and remained there. Now, you see the words, are you not a seer? The Hebrew does not include the word not, by the way, in the sentence. It just says, are you a seer? Uh, the, the connotation is basically the same whether you say, are you not a seer or are you a seer? It doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, it's a difficult, sen uh, difficult word phrase, uh, Hebrew word wording for almost all scholars, and yet I don't think it's worth messing with. Hebrew does not have question marks, by the way. So the wording is kind of short, uh, and, and by the way, it can be tr translated just you seer, just as well, just you seer. Or are you a seer? Are you not a seer? You seer, doesn't matter. The question is, you're a seer, or the thought is, you're a seer. You know and you see things. Nevertheless, the high priest was a seer. All the high priests were seers because they received divine revelations using the Urim and the Thummim, if you will remember. As such, Zadok could ask a question of the Urim and the Thummim and receive an answer. These questions could be as simple as, is it safe for the king to return to Jerusalem? Yes or no. Other passages indicate that the high priest was to use the Urim and the Thummim to discern the will of God. We find that in Numbers 27, 21, 1 Samuel 28, 6, Ezra 2, 63. Ezra 2, 63. None of these passages describes how the Urim and Thummim were used for this purpose. Nevertheless, in Jerusalem, Zadok could see and find answers with that Urim and Thummim. But he also could see, get this, the actions of Absalom and learn of his intentions and his, and his plans. So as we will see, with the help of Ahamez and Jonathan, those plans could be transmitted to David. And David would know what was going on. So we now come to the king's walk. David was in a rush to leave town and all those with him. So we see the state of the king's walk on his way to the Mount of Olives here in verse number 30 with what the king did. And David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went and his head was covered and he walked barefoot. David set the example the mass of people followed David's example. The covered head of the king was a mark of deep grief and acted as a sign that he wanted to be shut away personally from the world. Most all the men wore head coverings to shade from the sun, but the king did not wear a head covering. Walking barefoot was a different issue. From other passages, we can determine that barefoot being barefoot was a sign of mourning, of self-humiliation, and of penitence. We find that in 2 Samuel 19.4, Esther 6.12, and Ezekiel 24.17. In those passages, we find that it was the custom, the common custom among the Persians and also the Egyptians as well as the Israelites. And then we know from later in history outside the Bible that it was the custom of the Romans to go barefoot when they were grieving and mourning and seeking penitence. Now what did the people do? What the people did. Then all the people 
who were with him, each covered his head and went up weeping as they went. All the people with David followed his lead. David was weeping. David covered his head. David was barefoot. And the people were doing the same. As David walked barefoot, as he traveled, the people were in tears. They were barefoot, and they had their heads covered as they traveled along. No doubt, David had a tear or two also, if not many more, coming down his face. The people were crying. David was crying. What the king said is next, verse number 31. Now someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, a prayer. O Lord, I pray, make the counsel of Ahithophel foolishness. On the way up a mount, the Mount of Olives, David learned that Ahithophel was with Absalom. He could not have known this before. This has to be the first time. And among the hundreds who left Jerusalem with David, he had surely not noticed that Ahithophel, his one of his trusted counselors and his family were missing from the bunch. Well, Bathsheba was with him. That's Ahithophel's granddaughter. She was there. And because of that, that David might have assumed that Ahithophel was somewhere among this thousand plus number of people who's with David leaving Jerusalem. He was somewhere in the ranks among the crowd. No doubt David would soon call for his counselors to give their advice but he was not at that point in his journey yet so he had not called for them so he had not noticed that Ahithophel was not there but standing there on the Mount of Olives David paused when he learned that Ahithophel was not there and he prayed to the Lord and he prayed that the Lord would reject anything Ahithophel said to Absalom. I want you to notice that David being David did not pray against Ahithophel's personal physical well-being for harm in any way form or fashion he only prayed against Ahithophel's counsel he wanted the counsel that came out of his mouth to be rejected not what they didn't want his body hurt in any way praying against the person might have put a wedge a between him in Bathsheba and surely the king noticed that and knew that. So he only prayed that the council would be thwarted. Now we come to the king's friends. As David reached the top of the Mount of Olives, the king's friend met him and David asked for a favor. One that was a favor that was possibly dangerous. Verse number 32 with the friend's provisions. It happened as David was coming to the summit where God was worshipped that behold Hushai the archite met him with his coat torn and dust on his head. Now we all know the importance of the Mount of Olives in the days of the life of Jesus. But here we have a clue that allows us to know that that mount was a important place of worship of God hundreds of years before the days of Jesus. God was worshipped there on the Mount of Olives, it tells us. It was a special place in Israel. Its highest peak, the summit that they call it, is 2,700 feet above sea level. On the summit where Jesus will one day ascend into heaven and one day return, by the way, to touch his toe there, David meets his friend Hushai. As an archaic, it simply means that he came from a village on the border of the tribal area of Benjamin and Ephraim. Uh, we have to wonder if Hushai's arrival was an answer to David's prayer even. He, he was a counselor of David, a trusted man. We find that out in 2 Samuel 15, 37. Uh, we find it out in 2 Samuel 16, 16. We find it out in 1 Chronicles 27, 33. David had a plan for Hushai. He had an assignment. When he saw Hushai, his clothing was torn and dust was on his head. These are the normal traits of a person in mourning and in great grief. And so as David picks up his conversation with Hushai, 
uh, he asked his friend to do an assignment for him. So we come to the friend's assignment here in verse number 33. David said to him, If you pass over with me, then you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been your father's servant in time past, so I will now be your servant. Then you can thwart the counsel of Ahithophel for me. Why in the world would Hushai be a burden to David? We really don't know. But when we get to chapter 19, the same wording is going to be used. Now, I actually believe it probably applies here to Hushai. Perhaps it's because of Hushai's age. The age was the factor. In chapter 19, the same wording is going to be used of Barzillai. He's an old, old man, 80 years old. But even as an old man, Hushai, Hushai, who moves a little slower than everybody else as an old man, could be useful to David in this troubled time. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been your father's servant in time past, so I will now be your servant. David has asked Cushai to be a spy in Absalom's organization. And lo and behold, Cushai agreed. But Cushai will not be alone as a spy in Jerusalem. If you remember, David has already sent back the priest to be spies for him. It was a friend's connection behind enemy lines because no doubt Cushai knew these priests well because of his position with David and David's position with the priest. So we come to the friend's connections. Verse number 35. Are not Zadok and Abiathar the priest with you there? In other words, they're still over. They're already back over there. They're headed on the way. So it shall be that whatever you hear from the king's house, you shall report to Zadok and Abiathar the priest. And behold, their two sons are with them there, Ahamez, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them you shall send me everything that you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. Okay. The high priest and his sons would be a communication conduit between David and Hushai. Here was the plan. Hushai was to quietly and calmly act as a counselor to Absalom in the king's palace there where he's taken over because David's on the run. When Hushai discovers Absalom's plans, he was to tell either Zadok or Abiathar. Then Zadok, that was the high priest if you remember. Abiathar was a priest. He wasn't a high priest. Abiathar was a priest who helped the high priest at the tabernacle. Abiathar was a descendant of Eli, if you remember, and according to the Lord, he could not serve as the high priest because of Eli's sins. However, he could serve as a priest in the priestly line of duties in the nation. Zadok and or Abiathar would then translate or transmit what Hushai had heard to their sons, Ahamez and Jonathan. Their sons would get the information to David. Verse number 37 says, So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. Now listen to what that says. Pick up on this. Now we're not sure, but with this wording the way it is, it seems that Hushai made it the two miles back over into Jerusalem just before Absalom arrived in Jerusalem. So Zadok and Abiathar, Ahamez and Jonathan, And Hushai are back in the city as Absalom comes marching in with his band and his army. David and his men were just two miles away on the other side of the summit of the Mount of Olives. Now, we come now to David's great Mendacious. Just past the summit of the Mount of Olives, David with all his followers came upon Ziba, 
who would be David's great mendacious, and let me go ahead and translate it, liar. Ziba was the lying liar, and that's what the word means. Chapter 16, the turn of the chapter, verse number 1. Now when David had passed a little beyond the summit, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of saddled donkeys, and on them were two hundred loaves of bread, a hundred clusters of raisins, a hundred summer fruits, and a jug of wine. The king said to Ziba, Why do you have these? And Ziba said, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride, And the bread in the summer fruit for the young men to eat. And the wine for whoever is faint in the wilderness to drink. Then the king said, And where is your master's son? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is staying in Jerusalem. For he said, Today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. The great liar here. So the king said to Ziba, Behold, all that belongs to Mephibosheth is yours. And Ziba said, I prostrate myself. Let me find favor in your sight. O my lord, the king. Ziba's a liar. He's just lied about Mephibosheth. We can trust that the compiler has told us exactly what transpired in this meeting between David and Ziba. Past that, we can trust that this encounter occurred in the summer because of the mention of the summer fruits. But past those two points, we cannot trust Ziba in anything else he says. If you remember, David put Ziba in charge of Mephibosheth's property that was inherited from King Ishbosheth, that's King Saul's son who became the king after Saul, for two years before he was murdered. Mephibosheth would then be picked up as a gracious offer from King David and live and dine with David. But Ziba would take care of all Mephibosheth's property and the women and the daughters left of Saul and Jonathan's lines and Ishbosheth's lines of family and take care of them. We have to wonder how Ziba knew that David was leaving Jerusalem by way of the Mount of Olives, then getting to Gibeah, where the property was before returning to meet David uh, on the mount, on the northeast side of the mount. How did word get to him in Gibeah if he was there to bring this stuff? It was just too too soon, too close. Anyone running to tell Ziba about David's plan to leave Jerusalem could not have arrived in Gibeah when David passed by the Mount of Olives. Gibeah was just too far. And then for him to return from Gibeah with these items gather them and then return it just would take too long therefore Ziba could not have heard the news gather the supplies and met David in that short time Ziba had to know about Absalom's plan when he was going to be crowned in Hebron and when he planned to arrive in Jerusalem pretty close to the timing didn't have to be accurate could be within hours and he would be fine Consequently, we cannot trust that Ziba's report to David is true. The the amount of food that Ziba has brought matches what Absalom's army is, not what David's clan is that's with him. It matches an army of 200 or more because it's 200 loaves of bread and all that. But it doesn't match David's. It's more than 1,000. In addition, we must wonder why David left Mephibosheth in Jerusalem. Did he not think of Mephibosheth in his haste to leave the city of Jerusalem? Did he not expect to find Mephibosheth when he stopped to inventory the people at the edge of the town? Or on the other hand, did Ziba just happen to notice that Mephibosheth was not with David among the thousand people with David and determined that he was not he was staying in Jerusalem, therefore he lied about him. David said, Where's Mephibosheth? How come he's not with you? Oh, he's back in Jerusalem, planning to become the next king. Restoring the kingdom to me, he said. In addition, we do not know why Ziba had these supplies. They surely really were not for David. But he left them there. 
They were for a different crew, but he left them with David. They were probably for Absalom's crew. And most likely, Ziba did not intend to meet David on the road. It was a surprise. So Ziba must have lied about the purpose of these supplies. He had to have lied about the purpose of the supplies. Therefore, we cannot trust Ziba's statement to David at all. Neither can we trust Ziba's words that Mephibosheth expected to be the next king of Israel. We know that not to be true. Mephibosheth's nature that we've learned about was at all times be a grateful man. In his barefoot state of mind, David could not trust Ziba. I, I don't think he should. But as David was standing there barefoot, what we can trust is he did give everything that belonged to Mephibosheth to Ziba that day. That doesn't mean he's not going to take it away from him as we get to Mephibosheth and David later on in the text. But Nathan and Gad would have been there to hear what David was saying about all this on his flight from Jerusalem. And that's the reason why that one of them had to record these words and that got into our scripture so we'd know about Mephibosheth and Ziba when the story comes up later. If they didn't do it, if Nathan and, and or Gad did not do it, then probably David's historian surely wrote them down. We can also be sure that we will hear about Mephibosheth and Ziba again before the story in this book is covered because the Lord doesn't leave any ends untied. We come to Shimei, David's great disruption, and Shimei's rage here in verse number 5. After leaving Ziba, the king came upon Shimei. Call it Dave, we call him David's great disruption. When he neared the town of Baharim, he, he was a relative of King Saul, and because of that, we immediately know that he was from Baharim, or at least from the tribal area of Benjamin, which is, and, and Baharim is on the way to Gibeah, by the way, where Saul's ancestors were deeded the property by Joshua back in the, when the promised land was taken. The mention of these towns means that when David and his clan had passed over and around the Mount of Olives across the summit, they had turned north and were traveling, traveling up to the intersection of the road that would take them towards Jericho and past Jericho down to the Jordan River. The Jericho sat right on the western edge of the overflow area of the Jordan River on the west side. And they call that the Arabah. Verse number 5. Then King David came to Baharim. And behold, there came out from there a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. And he came out cursing continually as he came. He threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were at his right hand and at his left. Thus Shimei said when he cursed, Get out, get out, you man of bloodshed and worthless fellow. The Lord has returned upon you all the bloodshed of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. And behold, you are taken in your own evil, and you are a man of bloodshed. Two things are clear from Shimei's curse of David. First, Shimei disliked David taking the place of Saul and Ishbosheth after their death as the king of Israel. That should not be a surprise. When Saul died, all the tribes accepted, except I should say, when Saul died, all the tribes except Judah had made Ishbosheth their king for two years before Ishbosheth was, of course, murdered. Then David became the king of all Israel. It seems fitting that not everyone in Ishbosheth's kingdom wanted David to take his place. That's just natural. But it was an old grievance, at least 30 years in the past, reaching back to the death of Ishbosheth. Second, Shimei seems to already know Absalom's plan to become king. He said, the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. How did he know this? We actually know how he knows this. 
We found this in the last lesson when Absalom sent spies into the land to tell them to shout when they heard the trumpet blow, for Absalom had been crowned king in Hebron. That is how Shimei knew. Shimei couldn't have known it any other way. It had to have been told to him when those spies went out. Any other way, the timing was just too short for him to hear the news that day. Shimei supported Absalom. And no doubt Shimei may have met with Absalom at the gate back in Jerusalem two year, in the past two years when Absalom gave him a favorable judgment to his lawsuit and Shimei trusted in Absalom. Be that as it may, Shimei had another lucky break. He was lucky that this was David and David was the king. Shimei's reprieve. If Shimei had spewed such a vile thing at another one except King David, he would have lost his head that day. But because it was David, we come to Shimei's reprieve, verse number 9, with a Bishai's remark. Then Abishai, the son of Zariah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over now and cut off his head. I don't make this thing up. I couldn't make this stuff up. This is too good to be made up. Abishai's remarks were perfectly natural for a military man in the heat of a national takeover attempt. Yes, do it. Abishai wanted to protect David and cut down all enemies of the king and all enemies of the kingdom. And Shimei was clearly an enemy at this point. But David would not have it at all. And so we come to David's remarks. But the king said, What have I to do with you, O son of Zariah? If he curses, and if the Lord has told him, Curse David, then who shall say, why have you done so? Then David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son who came out from me seeks my life. How much more now, this Benjamite? Let him alone and let him curse. For the Lord has told him, Perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me instead of his cursing this day. So David and his men went on the way. And Shimei went along on the hillside parallel with him. As he went, he cursed and he cast stones and he threw dust on him. The king and all the people who were with him arrived weary. And he refreshed himself there. David's going on and, and the nature of David. This is the same nature we saw of David when he was on the run from King Saul. It's present here in this uh, reprieve of, uh, of Shimei. David would not allow Abishai to kill Saul when they had the chance because he knew the Lord would take care of Saul and the Lord did so with Saul's death. In like manner, David had not heard from the Lord about Shimei and David wondered if Shimei might have been correct with all his past troubles that David had. Shimei might be correct. Therefore, David wanted the Lord's verdict. He, he, he didn't want to take it on his own. So he allowed Shimei to live even though he was attacking the king with his words and with his stones and throwing dust on the king. It was a hard and weary trip up the road to Baharim. But with Shimei's curses, David and his clan moved on through the city of Baharim and made their way to Jericho, away from Baharim and away from Shimei. And then David, looking ahead in the scripture, we will find that David and his clan must have stopped at the ford in the road, of the ford, I should say, of the Jordan River, and we haven't gotten there yet in the scripture, where they waited for word about Absalom's plans. But when they reached the river, everyone cleaned up and everyone refreshed themselves. And so did David from the summer heat and the hard journey they had made that day. Ziba's supplies were undoubtedly in their hands. And though it wasn't much, 
they could sustain life for a little while if they shared there at the ford of the river. Now in our next lesson, Hushai will do what David sent Hushai to do in Jerusalem. And let me tell you this, he will do it very well as we will see. And we will understand why David was the great warrior that he was.